those that don't know, that was just an old Lead Belly song. I love the man. I'm old enough to have actually remembered him. And uh, I remember, but that's about the first memory I have of my whole entire life. I was about two years old, standing next to Lead Belly. He was a friend of my father's. I just have a memory of standing there holding on to a pant leg or something. No conversation, nothing. And, uh, but there was something special about it. And I asked myself years ago, why would standing next to somebody for a couple of seconds, maybe a minute or two, why would that moment in time stay etched in your brain for your entire life? There's no answer, I was just asking. He called himself the king of the 12-string guitar. And he was that. Go back and listen to the old records of Lead Belly, and he was doing stuff even back 50, 60, 70 years ago now, uh, 70 or 80 years ago, that uh, still by today's standards was awesome stuff. And I grew up wanting to play the 12 string because he did. And uh, it came in handy a couple of moments, times in my life, different highlights, you might say. I inherited other friends that lived a lot longer. That Billy passed away before I was three, that's how I know I was two. He was an old guy then. But other guys like Pete Seeger, who I also inherited, lived a lot longer. And uh, Pete was known for playing this big, long neck banjo that he basically invented. But he also played the 12 string guitar about half of the time. And if you ever saw Pete playing the 12 string, you probably didn't realize, but he was looking at Lead Billy. Because Pete stole everything he could from Lead Belly, and I naturally stole everything I could from Pete. That's the way it moves down, you know. So it's coming handy. It was about a little over a year ago now, I was up north of San Francisco and ran into an old buddy of mine I hadn't seen for years, a guy named Wavy Gravy. If you know that name, it's because you saw the Woodstock movie or something. He was the announcer saying, don't take the brown asses, man, whatever he was saying. I love the guy, you know. And the tour bus pulled around the back of the gig, and there he was sitting there, and I hadn't seen him in a long time. And I got out, gave him a big hug, sat down. He was trying to reminisce, but neither one of us could remember anything. So we just sat there looking at each other. And eventually we got around to talking about what was at that time, which would be last August, the 45th anniversary of the Woodstock Festival. And we were talking about it. We was working ourselves up into a frenzy because we heard they was trying to put together some kind of 45th anniversary reunion and we thought that was stupid. I mean, you know what I'm saying? I mean, the 45th is great for a wedding or a birthday or something like that. That's fine. We don't celebrate Woodstock on the 45th. You wait for the 50th. So we called up the promoters. We gave them hell. We said, what the hell are you guys thinking? They said, well, we was going to do the 50th, but you might all be dead by then. They had a point. I remember the 40th. That was bad enough. You know, the 40th anniversary of Woodstock, just before the 40th, I should say, we were in this 24-7 news cycle, well into it. And all the TV... Uh, people talking heads was trying to get a hold of anybody that was there at the original event to uh, interview them for their big 45 second story they were doing on the subject and I was just trying to avoid it because they was all saying the same stuff they all said Arlo what was it like man Peter Woods the dude you know? and I thought they don't actually talk like that except to me so it was kind of annoying and I just told them all the same stuff anyhow. I said, hey, I just remember getting there. <laughs> Not an interview worth, you might say. But I remember, you know, uh, I had bought a new car earlier that spring, 1969. It was one of these checkers. They used to use them for taxis in some of the big cities because you could put entire families in one car. And I wanted one because I thought I could put the whole band in that thing. So I bought a new checker. And sure enough, it was me and all my guitars and all my stuff and a big uh, a guy with a big double bass in those days, right? And a guy with a set of drums and all of his stuff. Another friend of mine with his guitars and all of his stuff. All of their girlfriends, all of their stuff. And we hadn't even opened the trunk yet. 
I miss those kind of cars. I know I'm supposed to like the stupid ones we got now, but I don't. Not just because they were big, but because they were built. My wife took it down the highway one time, pulled off an exit ramp, come to a stop, and a big semi-truck come right up behind her, smacked right into it. And the truck died. She drove home, said she thought something happened. That's when America made some cars, and I love them, you know. So we went to Woodstock and something like that, and I remember the closer we got to it, of course, the more traffic there was, just like here. And until it finally come to a dead standstill, and uh, they rerouted us to some motel because they was going to fly us into the site in a helicopter, and I was excited. I was 18, never been in something like that before. So it was me and Richie Havens and some other friends, and we got in this thing, and uh, the chopper took off, but the, the door stayed open. And no matter how high we went, there was people as far as the eye could see in every direction. And in the chopper with us was two New York State troopers, one on either side of the open door. On one side was a big John Wayne kind of guy. On the other side was a little Barney Fife kind of guy. And they was looking down there the same as us. And I remember the big one looked at the little one and said, there's a lot of hippies down there. <laughs> the little one said, yep. And the big one said, I, I bet they're doing lots of illegal stuff. And the little one said, yep. And the big one said, well, I'm not going down there, nothing, are you? And the little one said, nope. And that's when I realized we were going to have a pretty good time at that festival. <laughs> I was not mistaken. I got there on the first day of that three-day event, and I had that day off. I was supposed to play on the second day. And so I was walking around this field just about like this, except there was hundreds of thousands of people, a lot of mud and rain and stuff, and I was doing what everybody else was doing that day. And so later that afternoon, I had a serious case of the munchies. They didn't have fenders or nothing, you know. We were just hungry and looking for stuff to eat, and there was nothing. So I thought I'd go backstage. They'll have something there. <coughs> there was nothing back there but 147 cases of champagne. They're saving for the end of the event. And by the end of the first evening, that was gone. I don't remember how many cases I was personally responsible for. But between that and the other stuff we was doing that day, it came as a surprise when somebody come up and said, Arlo, you got to play now, man. I can't play now, man. I'm not even here now, man. I'm coming tomorrow. I said, no, you're here now, man. You got to play now, man. I said, I can't play now, man. I can't walk now, man. They said, we don't care about that. Richie Haven's been up playing for hours. and nobody else, you got to play now, man. And I was too young to realize I could have said no. So I grabbed a big 12-string guitar walked out on this huge stage and in the middle of that big stage they had a circular stage built right in so while the guys in front was playing you could set guys up behind them and when they was done just twist the stage around not be wasting time breaking down the first band setting up the second one it was a great idea i mean it didn't work but it was a great <laughs> idea and in the middle of that circular stage they had a big hole for all the cables and mic lines and wires and stuff like that they didn't tell me about the hole. I wasn't looking for the hole. I was looking at more people I knew I'd ever see again in my life at one time. And I was looking at them like you could back then. Each one individual. That's when I remember falling through time and space. And then the most unbelievable thing happened. I moved through the molecular structure of the wood itself. And I rematerialized on the other side of the hole, on stage, almost completely intact. That was my memory of it. <laughs>